waiting for the blinds, but I guess we'll, we'll do in full daylight. <laughs> so welcome to the colloquium this week. Uh, our speaker today is Rosal Boscarna from Stony Brook University. Uh, so as you might have heard at lunch today, after running her third Boston Marathon, she's decided to <laughs> stick around and give the colloquium <laughs> this afternoon. I think that's three, right? <laughs> Your third one. <laughs> yeah, in the rain as well. Uh, so many of you might know Rosalba because she was here during her PhD work, where she was advised by Avi Loeb, uh, working on theoretical aspects of uh, understanding gamma ray bursts. And so after that, she was a junior fellow in the Hi Harvard Society of Fellows here and then took a Spitzer Fellowship at Princeton. Afterwards, she was a professor at Colorado, and she's now a professor of astronomy and physics at Stony Brook. Uh, so Rosalba works on a number of things, ranging from high-energy astrophysics to cosmology, to even simulating exoplanet atmospheres. But today, she's going to talk to us about the mergers of compact objects and their electromagnetic and gravitational signatures. So. Thank you for the invitation. It's been really great uh, to be back. Uh, and uh, it was good for the marathon on Monday because I got a few more days to actually have a calm time to talk to uh, a lot of people. Uh, so I'll be talking about the merger of compact, ob uh, compact objects and uh, with, uh, particular, um, with a particular focus on the jo what we can learn from joint uh, gravitational wave and electromagnetic uh, observations. So just uh, to remind everybody, so where compact objects are coming from, uh, they come from the collapse of massive stars, the massive stars more massive than seven or eight uh, solar, massive, uh, solar masses or so. And as the outer layer go off when the iron core collapses and gives rise to a supernova, and I'm sure all of you have seen this movie multiple times. <laughs> Uh, on the other hand, uh, what happens to the core is what we care here to the iron core. And what happens uh, will depend on the mass of the, to the, of the original star to start with, and then to the mass, um, which relates to the mass of the core. So for masses below something between two or three solar masses, three is a hard limit. Um, it's a bit, we don't know exactly where it is, and this will be uh, an important component of the talk, actually, because it depends on the equation of state of neutron stars. But roughly, like above three solar masses is a hard limit. Uh, so below three solar masses is a hard limit. The um, the object will be above will be black hole, and somewhere below that three solar masses will be a neutron star. So when I'll be talking about compact objects in the rest of the talk, I'll be referring to either neutron stars and black holes, and which one uh, will be clear. So compact objects have become very uh, popular in, uh, in the news uh, as well as in, uh, in astrophysics uh, lately because they are the main source, uh, the strongest sources of uh, gravitational waves. And as you'll know, they've been detected by LIGO as of starting two years ago. All right, so there was a very quick uh, background and a reminder for everybody. Uh, so what are the objects that we're talking about? So this is now a very busy slide, but it's something I will go through uh, it slowly because it will be very important uh, for what I'll be describing in the future. So what we have here is a binary, which uh, uh, we have two objects, so we have three possibilities. And what this slide uh, shows are all the possible um, situations that can arise when those two compact objects uh, merge. In the top, we have two black holes, and this is the simplest situation. So when two black holes start their final in spiral, they are, there is a first phase, which is the cold indeed in spiral, as they get closer and closer, then the merger, and then eventually the black holes will have a ring, a ring down, and it will still be a black hole. So there are gravitational waves associated to each of these phases with different signatures that uh, astrophysicists know how to recognize. The situation gets increasingly more complicated as you add neutron stars. So let me first consider this one, which is the second in terms of possibility, which is the neutron star with the black hole. So what happens here depends now on, so zero torus depends on the relative uh, mass ratio between the black hole and the neutron star. If it's uh, above some, somewhere between three to five, and again, the exact number is not known because it will depend on the question of state of initial star. Uh, but then, so, f so again, for above uh, somewhere uh, this ratio, uh, then uh, um, the, uh, what happens is that the neutral star will basically uh, enter the short, uh, short radius of the black hole before being tidally disrupted. 
and the end result of this uh, merger will be just a black hole so in, in the ring down. On the other hand, for smaller mass ratios, then the tidal radius is outside of the shorter, uh, the shorter radius, and or more precisely the um, radius of the last stable orbit. So then one, what happens is that the, as the neutron stars start getting closer to the black hole, it starts getting tidally disrupted, and the orbital angular momentum will uh, end up forming uh, an accretion disk. So the end result here is a black hole, as uh, as central objects. However, sir, there will be an accretion disk surrounding it. And this is something that's very important when it comes to the electromagnetic counterparts, this difference here. Now let's go to the neutron star, neutron star merger. This is the most, uh, the scenario with the most possibility, as you can see here. So let's first start with the lower branch, uh, which is the well, simplest, so to speak. So if the sum of the masses of the two neutron star is larger than, let's say, the, this hard bounder, uh, bound of, uh, boundary of three solar masses, and the, the two masses are equal, then the end result is a direct collapse into a black hole. So this is because in order for some material to be tidal disrupted, the, there has to be an, a, a difference in the masses of the two neutron stars. So in this case, uh, the central object cannot be supported by, uh, like, a, by the neutron star um, forces, and therefore, and because we are above three solar masses, so there is no equation state that can allow a neutron star, and uh, the black hole is the end state. Now there can be another situation where the mass of the binary is not is uh, smaller than three solar masses. But on the other hand, it can be a situation where, um, where a star as a, um, as a non-rotating star will collapse to a black hole. So for a given equation state, so everything, everything here depends, the precise numbers depend on the equation state. On the other hand, there can be an intermediate state in which the uh, rotation of the star is uh, this neutron star, newly born neutron star. It's uh, uh, the, uh, rotating very rapidly. And it is the part of the rotation that helps uh, for a period of time uh, against the collapse. So we have an intermediate, uh, an intermediate object called upper-massive neutron star, uh, which will survive for some time. And then what it does, well, again, depends on, on the situation. Well, depends in, in particular on its mass. So if the mass is very high, then it will tend to collapse right away, and it's the most likely result is directly black hole. On the other hand, if it is lower mass, it may, as it starts rotating, it rotates very fast, it may shred some mass around it. And then when it collapses, there will be some accretion, some material, so an accretion disk surrounding it. Um, so this is this intermediate possibility. But then there can be also these possibilities above here, where now here, in, on this branch down here, the sum of the two neutron stars, the mass is it's larger than three, so the end state has to be a black hole. However, there are unequal mass, and therefore it's the analog of this branch, but with an equal mass, there is tidal disruption happening during the process of merger, and therefore the end result is a black hole plus an accretion disk. And then there is the <coughs> last <laughs> branch here, where the sum of the two neutron star is lower than the maximum uh, mass uh, for collapse for the given equation state, and then the end result is a stable neutron star. So lots of possibilities, and each of these uh, um, uh, branch here will be associated with a certain uh, signal in gravitational waves, but also, as we'll uh, see in a moment, it will be associated with different electromagnetic signature. So going to the electromagnetic counterparts after that general background uh, on, um, on gravitational waves. So this is just a very general slide, and I'll go into a bit more uh, specific details in a moment. So the general um, consensus or general uh, theoretical uh, you know, ideas, this is prior to um, uh, you know, the, the, the gravitational wave detection, was that if you, a binary black hole merger, uh, there is no, uh, no electromagnetic signature to be expected, but we'll dis rediscuss this later. Uh, neutron star black hole, again, it depends, and you remember there uh, why this, uh, I'm saying this on the mass ratio, so for lower mass ratio, when you can have an accretion disk, then the idea is that you may form a short gamma burst, and again, I'll discuss uh, the detail in a moment. Uh, and this will be followed by afterglow, uh, kilonova. 
and so forth, none for higher uh, mass ratio skews the mass, mass ratio. Uh, for a binary neutral star merger, uh, in most configuration, one expects a short gamma ray burst and after the kilonova. So for those of you who don't work on short gamma ray burst um, every day, yeah. so let me just give a, a very quick reminder why we would um, have a short gamma ray burst, what are the general ideas. So assuming you have a two neutral star or a neutral star black hole um, with the, the right mass ratio, so the idea is that, again, as the neutron star uh, uh, gets closer and closer to the black hole, some material gets studied or disrupted, so you're forming the black hole. So remember that from the previous slide. And then the basic idea that we have uh, on, uh, on short gamma reverse, but this is the same as long gamma reverse as well, that it's from the rapid accretion of material onto the black hole that the power is, arises for eventually driving a jet. So this is the source. Of, so we have a power of energy here, which is a crucial material, onto the black hole. And this is why, for the merger of two black holes, the general ideas were that we do not expect any electromagnetic counterpart that comes from, from this. Um, so this, again, I believe the short GRBs. And just, again, for those of you who don't uh, work on this all the time, just a reminder why, you know, short and long, since uh, I'm using this terminology, this, you know, like a, a diagram of uh, you know, histograms of uh, gamma burst uh, over a number of years. And um, as you see here, the distribution is bimodal. So these were long understood to be associated with um, collapse of massive stars. They're called long gamma burst. And uh, below two, two seconds, uh, the, the, there was this general idea that may be associated with the merger to compact objects, but we had uh, up to now, we had no, uh, you know, no real direct evidence. So whereas we had direct evidence from, for the long GRBs since they have been seen associated with supernova. Okay, so that's all. Uh, um, so this is an overview. And now also showing uh, more of uh, some of the work done in this, uh, in this area. So uh, and more specifically uh, showing with the, an actual simulation how we go from the merger of two neutron stars on to uh, uh, possibly producing a short uh, gamma ray burst. So this is uh, now a natural simulation uh, that shows what I had before with my PowerPoint. Uh, so it's run with the uh, GRMHD code uh, uh, whiskey. So what you see here are two unequal mass neutron stars. And as they get closer and closer in their final dance, you see here, so there is the form, in this particular simulation, the central object is a black hole. And you see there's a lot of mass uh, here, which is, gets ejected. And this is the mass that will eventually accrete. And time scales for accretion are very short. There are sub-second time scales. And that's the natural time scale for producing uh, a short GRBs. So you see here um, all this material. So this is the source of energy. And it, it is, in terms of uh, how much mass we have, it's basically in the right bulk. Uh, factor of what it's needed to power the energy that we have seen in short GRBs. So then the next step of uh, the simulation is our the, I mean, the theoretical calculation to, to try to match what we <clears throat> believe we have seen in the past. So this is even before, uh, before the gravitational wave event, but these short GRBs have been seen for many, many years. Uh, so the idea is that uh, the, um, they are the jets, and actually Edo's group have shown more convincingly uh, with the um, uh, with the uh, uh, afterglow observations that they they do have jets like long GRBs, so the next uh, you know step of the theoretic understanding is how we can produce jets, and this is an area where there is still work ongoing. This is one of the early simulations that showed the presence of magnetic field lines uh, being mostly poloidal. So this is the idea: is that these jets may be driven uh, via magnetic fields. So producing jets in this context is more of producing magnetic fields that uh, they are uh, preferentially uh, poloidal. Um, so it's an area in which there has been a lot of work. This is also work uh, um, uh, including uh, from a group of, from a former uh, postdoc of mine who is now a professor and his own postdocs. I still work with them. Uh, so what we have here. Are, uh, is the structure of magnetic field in uh, a number of configurations. So we explore a configuration with different initial uh, magnetic field uh, uh, inclinations and different equation of states. 
So basically what these uh, uh, simulations are showing is that uh, uh, jets are indeed formed and indeed that these double neutral star mergers uh, can be, you know, can be produced in jets and therefore this, uh, uh, the short GRBs uh, that we are seeing. So just to complete the picture for again all of you who are not uh, uh, working on this. So I've described how we produce energy. So we have the, we start with the merger, we form a, comp a compact object, a black hole, let's say, and then we have some material creating, so that provides a source of energy. Then we have some poloidal magnetic fields, so you're basically uh, driving a jet, but then the question is where is the gamma ray and afterglow, later, longer wavelength radiation coming from? And this is a, 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 you know, a general diagram that has been used a lot in this uh, field. It's, it doesn't matter whether it's a longer, short, or GRB. This is, in fact, a longer one. The idea is that you have an engine, which is a black box, as far as this model is concerned. Uh, and then the drives, once you have a, you know, a lot of energy released within a short time and a short volume, is driving uh, a jet, uh, well, a jet and a sh shock with, within the jet. And then uh, particles are accelerated. And the idea is that within these shocks, um, so ac particle, accelerated particles will be, it's, it will be uh, radiating, and it's a mixture for the prompt radiation, a mixture of Compton and synchrotron. Um, and then as the shock propagates into the medium, slow, slow down, it's a bit like a big supernova remnant, except it's much more relativistic. It slows down into the medium and will emit radiation that goes all the way from the X-ray to the optical to the radio. And again, these are electrons that are within the shock that are being accelerated. And the energy which they're accelerating, it depends on the energy of the shock, which is stronger at early time. So you start from X-rays and then uh, it declines at uh, optical radio with time. So this gives a bit uh, the, over, the overall picture of the phenomenon. And here, again, either long or short, it's very similar. And just to give you a sense of the scales, uh, X-rays are usually a few hours. Optical is uh, peaking mostly over days, time scales, and then radio will be all the way um, for months. So that's uh, uh, completing uh, the picture. So where are we now? We have so gravitational waves and electromagnetic signature together, and. Uh, there has been already uh, one event and you know, things that have been done and things that can be done for the future. This is just a list, it's a not even, it's, a, it's just a partial list of, uh, of uh, science that can be, uh, that can be, uh, that can be done with uh, these combined observations. So for example, constraining, when you have them together, one can constrain uh, compact object formation via localization, so which is something that can be done much better when the electromagnetic counterpart is known. Uh, measure independent the luminosity distance because the gravitational waves gives an independent measurement and therefore that can be used to uh, measure the Hubble constant. This is of relevance in cosmology. Uh, constraint difference between speed of light and speed of gravity. Uh, test of Lorentz invariance. Learn about the origin of very heavy elements as we have learned from the uh, last event, uh, but also probe jet formation, speed and evolution, which is something that uh, we can, which we can learn a lot more when we have uh, both, uh, both uh, um, uh, measure, both observations together. Uh, and therefore learn more about the physics of the merger and uh, this association with short GRBs and also constrain on the equation state of that dense matter. So all of this could make many, many talks. And for the rest here, I will focus mostly on this last part, which is the part I've been mostly uh, working on in the last uh, year or so with, um, with these observations. Okay, so um, uh, just uh, so equation of state, as I said, is one of the things that uh, um, astrophysicists are interested in. So what is the issue here? The issue is that we don't know uh, the, you know, the density of matter in neutron star is a nuclear density <coughs> and exactly um, you know, what, what is this equation of state is, uh, is not known. So there have been a lot of uh, theories and a lot of calculations. As you see here, it's a bunch of uh, representative uh, ones. Um, and, uh, but there is no consensus yet. So there's, we're starting to get some constraints, but, uh, but we, we haven't pinned it down yet. 
And traditional methods uh, have been uh, mostly aimed at direct measurements of mass radius since it's a, it, each equation state gives a precise relationship between the mass and radius and therefore measuring them independently. Uh, it's a way to, uh, would be, I mean, it would be a way to go. However, I mean, masses can be measured, you know, relatively well in a binary, uh, but radii measurements are always, has always been, have always been problematic because they're, you know, convolved with the distance. So if you have a distance error, then that translates into radius. And also, if you are emitting from a smaller region on the surface of the star, that also affects the radius. But anyway, those, those have been the main methods so far. Now, with the gravitational waves, uh, we have, there's been a new window open on, uh, on this problem. So just to see you know, why uh, and uh, you know, what, uh, you know, how, how that is, so let me, um, so let me show some, uh, some examples. So first of all, this is a more, um, it's a, it's a more technical uh, diagram, which is uh, showing a case that was in the early slide with all those many combinations. And it's in particular um, what we show here for, is for one specific uh, equation state. Uh, what, what is the, so these are st basically stability curves for no, no rotating neutron star and for, uh, this is for a maximum rotating neutron star. Uh, why I'm showing this is because uh, I want to start by showing you a, a simulation. It was the first GR MHD image simulation that was done where from the merger to neutron star it was produced uh, a stable neutron star. The point here is that gravitational waves bear the imprint of the equation state on neutron star. So this has been now an old field that had started before, but now it's becoming a very, you know, very active. So let me start by showing you. Uh, so this is again uh, another simulation done with the same uh, whiskey MHD code. Um, that I, uh, I mentioned before, um, and it's, uh, it's the first case where uh, was actually, we start from the neutron star, two neutron stars and producing a stable neutron star. So we can study its properties, its characteristics, and then compare with the data as they come. So this was the gravitational wave signal for this particular event. And it was in our uh, first paper a few years ago. Now, uh, in the last uh, uh, couple of years, we have been working more in, uh, in this area. And uh, just as a reference, like each of these simulations is like, like, that was like three weeks. So these papers have been like m several months of supercomputer time. Um, so there we had to stop actually the neutral side and you, like hadn't completely settled, but we had run out of computer time. It was almost a month, the previous one. Uh, so just to give you a bit of a sense of, uh, uh, so this, uh, they don't run on, on your laptop. Um, so, but basically what I'm showing here just gives a bit of an idea of the, um, you know, hopefully where the future will go. And uh, so what we have is, here we started with uh, two neutron stars, which were, have, they have identical masses, so everything is identical, uh, same magnetic field, the same configuration. And uh, the only thing that difference is the equation state. And basically what you can see here that as the two neutron stars merge, the end product is very different in, uh, in the three cases. Uh, so here you see the moment that where is the collapse to, uh, to a black hole. And uh, I think these two were leaving behind uh, um, an upper massive initial star uh, up to the last uh, moment here. So the bottom line of this, uh, so the, the message uh, from this calculation is that, um, you know, like the gra gravitational wave sig uh, signal has the potential to really tell the equation state. Now, the, qu the problem, just also, to, you know, to give a bit of a sense of where we are, right now so we you know you've heard this you know this very famous event which i will discuss also a little bit later um that was very close it was a 40 megaparsec but with the current sensitivity of ligo so we basically we saw only this part so we didn't even get it was like about up eight cycles or so before the merger so the problem is that before you have you see there are some differences in the three cases but 
you know, the, you know, a lot more information could be gathered after. However, we're still very far with the current sensitivity unless we have really one in our backyard uh, to be able to measure these differences to, to such a high sensitivity. Uh, uh. Why is this? Uh, sorry, I don't know. My computer is rebelling on me. Uh, okay, I'm back. <laughs> um, uh, so, okay, so uh, sensitivity, but yeah, it, it gives you a bit of an, an ex, uh, a sense of where you know with uh, with um, you know more and more sensitive uh, uh, instruments as LIGO and others will come on board. So that's the idea where we're going. But where we are now, we're still in the early part. So where some information can be gathered, but not quite what we like to. So one question, given this background, <laughs> uh, so I will uh, now talk a little bit about uh, another um, work where we we asked ourselves, okay, you know, given where we are now, can we still something learn something about uh, uh, combined observation from short GRBs and gravitational waves without uh, um, measuring the detailed signal, uh, which we cannot measure right now uh, after uh, after the merger? So. Uh, what, uh, so let me describe what we have here, uh, so what we did. So what is the basic idea? So if you have, so we, we start with the distribution of masses of uh, neutron stars in binaries as measured in our galaxy. So that's the distribution that we saw, and we have it here. Then uh, we asked ourselves, uh, this was in this work here, uh, the following question. When we merge these two uh, neutron stars, what is the end product for different equation states? And the interesting thing, as should have been now clear with all the, uh, the discussion I had before, it's actually it's very sensitive on the equation state. And as it turns out, if you take the distribution of you know, observed in our gas, it, it, it actually where the various end prongs that are separated from one another, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting place because it's, it varies quite a bit. So here you would have a large fraction in this equation state of black holes. And then you have other equation state where the prediction would be that you would have all stable neutron stars. So this is something that actually it's, it's a quite interesting as a piece of information on its own. So given that we were wondering, okay, what uh, maybe since we're only observing now, you know, one event um, from uh, so far with LIGO, so can we use other observations? And this is uh, what we uh, so what we uh, what we uh, did. Um, and let me describe <laughs> what is the idea. So, if short GRBs are indeed associated with, uh, indeed with, uh, you know, with uh, uh, binary neutron star mergers or neutron star black hole mergers, uh, then uh, you know all these observations that we're seeing after tell us about the the afterglow observation, the actually pre afterglow, like the immediately after the gamma ray um, uh, phase. So the, the early phases will contain some information on the property of the object that's left behind. And this is something that was noted uh, by other, you know, a number of other groups. And this is an example for this paper here where they noted, uh, you know, just two example here, just as, to make the point, uh, where they, these are X-ray data uh, following, immediately following the event. And what they, they suggested here by fitting the data with the plateau that this may be a case where this plateau, which is not easily explained in any way, may actually be simply that we're seeing a neutron star. This is like a, a, a magnetar, basically. It's the plateau that you see uh, are in the, it's a dipole radiation, basically. It's a plateau and then following a decay. So this, you can say, okay, this is actually a stable neutron star. On the other hand, this is another event where there is well, initially this decay, and then a suddenly drop, which cannot be easily explained in any way with shock physics. So the way they interpret is that this is a supermassive neutron star that at that point collapsed onto the black hole. So these are two examples. Now there has been uh, um, a, an analysis of all the um, short GRBs um, that, w that had data uh, by a group. This is Bing Zhang group at uh, Nevada. And uh, what they did was uh, they, so they analyzed this, you, you know, you see like that type of analysis that you saw before. And uh, they classified the uh, merger products depending on uh, how the light curve looked like. So what they argued was that 22% of the merger product of short GRBs would be 
uh, supermassive neutron star, so uh, rapidly rotating. Now, I want to say, so I, I will discuss the results here, but I, I will take this as a grain of salt because some of the data, I, I feel like you can feed them in different ways depending on how your eyes like guide them. They're not as clear as the ones I showed you before. Uh, but taking it as a, uh, you know, as a face value, then one can actually draw already very strong conclusions on equation states and also the property of short So let me uh, uh, describe how. So we have seen that from the binary merger and for a given equation state, you predict a certain specific number, you know, fraction of end products, uh, the slide I had before. So here we're being told that a certain percentage uh, requires that, you know, like uh, a certain percentage is a uh, stable neutron star. So then you can compare it with the prediction for each uh, equation state. Now, if an equation state predicts a fraction which is larger than what they measure, then the conclusion has to be that some a fraction of short GLBs cannot be due to double neutron star merger, but it has to be something else. So most likely a neutron star black hole merger, which by itself is an interesting factor because we don't know yet whether also neutron star black holes are actually producing the same type of short GLBs as neutron star neutron star. Um, on the other hand, there are other equation states which predicts no uh, no uh, stable, uh, like no supermassive neutron star. In this case, you would conclude that, that those equation states are uh, basically ruled out by the data. So, uh, just to summarize, this type of analysis, uh, while so the data, as I said, I won't. So we didn't push it as a, you know, making very strong statement because the data in some bursts that you, I think you could interpret, um, you know, not as clearly as this case here. You know, um, however, um, it's a sort of it's a, a, a very you know independent type of analysis where you use it, you're coupling observe uh, uh, ob, you know like electromagnetic uh, counterpart observations uh, in order and uh, to to set constraint on the equation state. So it's sort of a thing as as we move forward and we couple some information from gravitational waves where we have it and depending on the sensitivity that we have at any given time, but also with the electromagnetic counterparts, which can tell us about the remnant product. So it's something that uh, should be, you know, we should continue doing and uh, doing good analysis of <laughs> any time uh, looking at it. Uh, we have a short sure uh, with uh, so follow them up because, the, you know, the property of the remnant, just knowing what it is can be actually very informative once you start building a statistic. Okay, so with that, now let me move uh, to talk a little bit more, uh, a little bit more with um, one aspect of uh, this very famous event, uh, which I'm sure you have all heard, and this is the, uh, just well the <laughs> summary of all the well the well it shows the viewing of the uh, LIGO and uh, and the Fermi and. Uh, so as you know, it was a very well localized, partly because Virgo had not seen it originally, and that helped because there were only a few regions in the sky where Virgo had the lower sensitivity. So there was they come, you know, it was very lucky. So it was, we were lucky because it was so close, and it was, we were lucky as uh, the fact that it was just placed very well for Virgo not to see it, or to see it. Uh, they went back to the data. It was a two sigma, but it, in, in uh, so they, they could. Uh, place it very well uh, where where it had been, and uh, as you know, uh, also I'm sure this was seen at every possible wavelength by any instrument which uh, could possibly have it seen. And I won't discuss you know too much of this since uh, it's been uh, very much in the literature. So, uh, what did we learn from this alone? And again, this is a summary of uh, as you probably. <laughs> I've seen uh, a lot of different things, uh, which would be, um, so just a summary, we have confirmed the presence of uh, electromagnetic radi radiation from binary neutral star merger, learn where the heaviest element come from, constrain the speed of gravitational waves to be the speed of light within a very high precision, learn something about the ejecta, uh, there was already reported an independent measure double constant and some constraint on the equation state from the early phase of the merger and, and more. So um, what I want to 
talk uh, here specifically uh, as a part of my talk on this object is uh, one important question which has not been still um, completely resolved. And that is that th if this GRB, the, the, you know, this electromagnetic counterpart associated with this event, was it indeed a standard GRB? So why is this, uh, uh, why do I pose this question? It's, well, as a first, um, um, first thing, as you, you know, if you compare this, uh, this event, uh, the, its luminosity, with the ones of the short, other short GRBs, you see that's much, um, was much, the several orders of magnitude dimmer. So that's already something that like, okay, it was not within the bulk of, um, of those uh, short GRBs. Uh, so is this, um, you know, a, a, a normal one? Well, what, so here is where there's still some debate in the literature, I'll try just to explain where we are. And uh, uh, again, the, 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 the verdict is still uh, to come. So what uh, we basically, you know, we argued uh, is that, well, it's, it, you know, this is really not surprising because, you know, in a standard GRB, the, the emission is supposed to be jetted. And if you take, you know, average angle as measured by Edo's group, it's uh, for short sure GRBs, like somewhere around 16 degrees, then you only expect, to, you know, one out of 20 roughly to be an axis and therefore bright. And so you, you're actually more likely to see the first one that you're seeing off axis. And uh, at the fair, what we did was uh, trying to see whether, you know, taking a standard GRB with all the properties of, you know, that have been simulated for the you know, standard short GRBs, uh, looking off axis whether we could reproduce the properties of these objects. So this is some um, first um, um, uh, slides that are shown here, and the answer is uh, is yes. So. Uh, what, the, what are we looking at here, first of all? Uh, so this is a isotropic equivalent energy. There are different curves. So one is the uh, total, which is the blue one, the kinetic energy, the red is radiated. And then there was the, um, the thermal, non-thermal component, or if it's dominated by thermal or non-thermal in the GBM, which, is, uh, which was the detector that's in it. Uh, basically, for comparison with that uh, particular event, because it, was, it had a non-thermal, a spectrum, so you will basically the magenta curve is the one that you want to care uh, fundamentally. So basically, and looking at those luminosities, so what you see here, so they were like a few times into 46 or so. So basically, an angle somewhere around here um, is something that would, you know, would not surprise you. Uh, so something around 30 or something degrees or so uh, would fit the data without any, you know, particular uh, surprise for making anything strange. But then there is also another piece of information, as you, I'm sure, you recall. There was a time delay between the gravitational wave event and the um, and the, um, uh, the the gamma ray radiation. It was like 1.7 something, so somewhere around two seconds. And here again, if you're looking sideways and so you have your photon coming, there is a certain time delay, which is the angular. It's an angular time delay that dominates there. Uh, if you're looking off axis. So that's also something that one can calculate, and we calculate it. And it's, these are independent, because one is like is the luminosity, and the other is, is it's, it's a more geometric um, uh, component. But both also here, so if you, like around a uh, um, you know, few seconds or so, again, you are around 30, seconds, uh, 30 degrees or so. Uh, so both these two are, you know, some are, you know, can be made consistent with the, basically with the data uh, with uh, with this off axis angle um, with the, with the no surprise and these are also I should say so you know an angle or that order is also consistent with the gravitational wave observation which is again not you know like non trivial piece of information because it's a completely independent um, 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 uh, observation now Months have passed by, so there was like the gamma ray, so immediately after the event, now this object has been observed for uh, as long as it could be uh, been observed at uh, all different uh, uh, wavelengths, and therefore one can calculate also the afterglow associated with, um, with the, such an event, not just the prompt emission. Uh, and here, it's, uh, so what we're showing, it's a multi <laughs> whatever, but it's basically what the, this uh, curve is showing. Uh, so we have an observer here at some angle. So as time goes on and on, uh, so initially, uh, because the jet is, you know, it's, it's relativistic, you're seeing within one over gamma. So as the time goes on, you're seeing more and more of the emission from wider angles, which is, you know, the typical 
a standard GRBs um, uh, um, a scenario. And uh, yeah, therefore, with time, you start seeing more and more of different regions. So comparing, so that was the, just the general idea, but comparing with the data, so basically, um, so the um, so the same model that was produced for the for the gamma ray emission, it's also able to fit. And so these are data at different um, different um, uh, bands and uh, as a function of time. So this is where we are. Now this is an important point now to make because it's um, so what we so what we concluded that what we are concluding in our work is that this event is actually con it is a normal short GRBs scene of axis, of axis so there is nothing you know too uh, surprised about that. However, so there is a, an, uh, another alternative interpre interpretation in the literature where uh, the idea there is that uh, it was published early on, so it's a restricted set of data, but uh, the point is that uh, what, they, uh, what they did there is assuming an isotropic emission, so it would not be a standard GRB, it would be, um, so it's, it's, uh, it's basically isotropic emission, where they produce this, um, you, you know, because you have to have some increase in energy and decline, and that is uh, achieved via a, a certain velocity distribution in the ejecta. So there is this extra parameter, because you have, it, so you don't have any more, you know, your one over gamma that opens and it gives you pretty constrained behavior in your light curves. And once you have reached the maximum, which is when you have the jet, then you can only decline because you're seeing on the other side of the jet where the emission is lower. So it's, it's a very well constrained, the jet model. On the other hand, uh, when you have, you know, a spherical object, so the way to fit there, uh, there is a distribution in gamma of the ejecta and that, uh, you know, that gets translated into a distribution of energy with time. Um, so this is something where, again, body inter interpretation can fit the data uh, with this, uh, again, so with, with this caveat here that there is a certain distribution that needs to be assumed. But it's a, it's a non, uh, uh, it's not just a matter of a detail. Uh, it's really, it's a fundamental difference because if, you know, this is really, if this were the correct interpretation, then the event that we have seen here is not a standard short gerbis. So this is something to keep in mind <laughs> as you, you know, you hear more and read papers and also, you know, as we have more events eventually, uh, you know, uh, yeah, as we see more, we'll hopefully understand more. But that's where, where we are now. So just to um, make this point clear. Okay, so I still have a little bit of time. So to talk a little bit of, uh, it's be more the speculative side and now the, of the talk, so I'm going back in time, um, which was the, the first event, and there was the binary um, black hole. Um, I think this may even be a movie, if I recall correctly, this thing here. And if I can pull my, no. I don't know where my cursor is now. Okay, anyway, it's uh, the signal here, uh, but it's, uh, it's also here, so that's okay. Um, so you, I'm sure you all uh, remember uh, these events, and there were two uh, large black holes um, and so forth. So it was nothing, you know, I mean, I'm, well, nothing to surprise other than the fact that the masses were larger than what uh, people had imagined to start with. But that's not the part that I want to uh, talk about. So the part that I, oh, it's, it's here actually. <laughs> now it's appearing. Go to the next slide. So the um, so what I want to talk next is this uh, um, reported uh, candidate um, uh, counterpart to the binary black hole mergers, which again I'm sure you uh, all heard. It was um, so it was a lower significance. It's been debated in just among the observers alone from between the Fermi team and other teams that reanalyzed the data. So, so I you know, don't want to be uh, to comment on, you know, we'll love to see with, again, more events. Uh, but, you know, it's, as theorists, it's always fun to think about uh, possible explanations of possible observations. And uh, within the first uh, 48 hours or so, there were a number of papers, including uh, Avi, is that a year? <laughs> And um, uh, Bing Zhang and uh, and uh, another from our group. So just um, um, just wanted to have basically just that one slide on um, on what is uh, so on our idea. Um, 
so remember early on, you know, the, the idea that the fact that, you know, binary black holes would not have an associated electromagnetic counterparts comes from the fact that they're, you know, believed to be naked. So if you are thinking of have, if there is indeed some, you know, electro, if there is an electromagnetic signature, then you want to think of some way to actually have mass around black holes that are merging. So that's sort of where the idea started from. So uh, what was our, um, so our idea here is, so you have, you know, two black, your two black holes, and uh, black holes come from the uh, collapse of massive stars, and uh, rotating, you know, can be rotating massive star, and, and um, um, if you take, a, so this is just a standard, I mean, nothing particular special, so it's a star which had um, a rotation, this is 37% of their critical rotation, to start with, but it's nothing extreme. And uh, these two lines here are the uh, specific angular momentum of a particle at the last stable orbit for Schwarzschild and for uh, Kerr. Uh, bottom line, both, you know, the, the point here is that if the star is sufficiently rotating, then the outer layers of the envelope of the star have enough angular momentum to circularize around the black hole. So this is basically, if you're above uh, uh, this, you know, either these two lines depends on this is curved black hole or even Schwarzschild black hole, then this material, once it falls back after, if it's not attracted into space, if it remains bound, then it will, it will form a disk because it, it has enough angular momentum to form a disk. So that's a natural uh, thing, so nothing uh, particularly uh, strange here. Then, uh, uh, then it's standard, actually standard disk evolution uh, with uh, so you start with a relatively massive disk and you let it evolve and accrete, it will accrete at the same time, so it will deplete. Uh, but it gets to a point where the MRI shuts down and uh, as it cools. And this is what it's called dead disk, which again is not something that we invented. Dead disks are known in planetary systems, uh, cold disks which stay you know, there for a very long time because once you don't have any more MRI, then then um, uh, the disk will not be able to, uh, to accrete. And therefore, the idea is that will stay there for a very long time around the, one of these two black holes. It doesn't have to be both, uh, just uh, one is enough. And then, so that's, you know, like uh, whatever number of years, uh, millions of years, billions of years. And then eventually, as the two black holes start getting closer and closer to one another, uh, when uh, the basically at some point the gravitational time scale, so the black hole star enters enters the disk, and that the gravitational time scales, uh, which is it's a it's a very it has a very steep power. It's like uh, distance to the fourth. So it basically as they get closer and closer, the gravitational time scale becomes very short, and that point is black hole we enter the the disk, and the idea is that basically at that point it will stir it. So once the black hole becomes very close, then orbits start becoming uh, chaotic, they no longer close. And you can imagine that at this point uh, that you will have shocks and the disk will, re will uh, reignite and accrete very rapidly. So the, 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 you know, in, this, uh, in this scenario, one would have a certain you know, time delay between the merger and, and the, basically the time that it takes the, the, for the material to accrete, which here from this separation where the two time scales, the viscous time scale and the gravitational time scales, um, when they become equal at that point, it basically, um, the black holes merge and then the disk accretes on that time scale. So this we found here to be a fraction of a second. So it just, and it, it just works out uh, to be uh, what you, the time delay was 0.4. Um, for um, for that event, so it's um, anyway, it's, it's an idea. So we'll see uh, with um, with time. So uh, I still have a few more minutes and just a couple of slides. Uh, so you know, one question that came after. Uh, so you know, we have this model, and it, like, but you know, the, then you want you still. So once you have some matter, then. And um, so we have a model for the matter. Then the question is, can you still, however, drive a jet and have a, a short GRBs? And this is something that actually uh, very recently a simulation by, uh, this is the Shapiro group, which is one of the top group in the world uh, to do this kind of thing. So, so they address this problem. Uh, and you know, our work was one of their ones they relied on as a motivation uh, to see um, 
um, basically what happens when two black holes merge in the presence uh, with uh, some matter surrounding it. And uh, basically what they showed is that, yes, you can form a jet. So, um, so if you do have some matter, then you may actually have uh, uh, around, uh, you know, from two black hole mergers, have an event which may look like a short GRBs, contrary to all the earlier, all the earlier um, expectations. So just uh, um, to put it into context, uh, um, because this is a question that has been uh, often been asked to me, um, is like, well, but you know, we have five events, five binary black hole merger event. There was another which was a trigger. It's indicated with LTV. Uh, why, you know, one case is, is, you know, sort of shakier, you know, that it's, well, there is one tentative counterpart, but then why didn't we see from any other? And again, this goes to the same argument as we had for, that, for the other, for the binary neutral star merger. So it, it, the thing is that if they are in the jet and we have only seen six, uh, so if, you know, unless, so for a jet, which is, you know, anything smaller than a sixth of the sky, so you do, would not be expecting actually to see from, you know, from all the events. So again, it goes to that, to the fact that, yes, if we have, uh, if we have a jet and uh, we, and it's dim, you're likely, and especially these are further away, we see gravitational waves are not as close as the other one, then, yeah, naturally you would not be seeing <laughs> From all of them, so it's it's uh, it's it's consistent with expectation also because these jets would tend to be relatively narrow. So it's um, so bottom line here. Uh, this is an exciting area <laughs> where will uh, will be uh, will be nice to see uh, what um, the next uh, rounds of observations with LIGO and uh, all the electromagnetic uh, follow-ups uh, will give us. And with that, um, so I'll uh, basically uh, conclude. So just to summarize, the detection of gravitational waves in connection with the electromagnetic emission from binary compact objects uh, is bound, is already done, but is bound to have much more of an impact on uh, understanding of high energy phenomena, gravity, nuclear physics, cosmology. So it is a golden era where we are in, and that's all. <laughs> Ejector business, although you've touched upon it. I'm not sure if you're a co-author on that paper. There was this problem that if you find the mass ratio of the two, I'm talking of 17 over 17. Mm -hmm. So uh, the best estimate for the mass ratio from the gravitational wave signal by tilt is close to one. Right. You can yeah. Have the exact time, how close it is. But if you then compare with what's expected from the Telenova observations, what kind of uh, masses would you, would you expect for that mass ratio. The best estimate from that mass, uh, ejector mass, I, I guess it's between 10 minus 2 and 10 minus Yeah, 10 to mass. mass. So yeah. I, I don't know these numbers. But 0 0.05. 0.05, yeah. Okay. And so that estimate turns out to be, of the mass ratio, mm -hmm. more like 1.5 or more. So there was a serious conflict there. I wonder what the status is now. As of a couple of months ago, it was still hanging. Yeah, so for Q, uh, I don't remember what is the, because I think it's, I mean, it's not as well constrained. I mean, it's, it's 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.7, 0. 0.7, right, yeah. Yeah, and that's right. So, yeah, so if you take 0. 0.7, you can already have quite a bit, actually, of ejecta, so depending on, and it, and there again, it depends on the equation state. So software equation state, you, know, yeah, you can, yeah, matter. so it's, uh, yeah, because with 0. 0.7, that was the last, and uh, I did look into that at right. some point. It was not, uh, yeah, not unreasonable. How far away are we from learning the neutron star equation of state from these types of measurements? Are we limited at this point by just number of objects? Are we limited by systematic things that we don't know, like inclination? You know, if we're limited by number, what number do you think we need to get to to really put into the state? Yeah, so it's, uh, it, so it, it's, it's hard to say, yeah, like, uh, um, because, you know, if you have an event very nearby, then we can learn a little more. So it's a combination of sensitivity and uh, how many, you know, um, how many, we are starting to learn because as we get, you know, like closer and closer, but, uh, but yeah, I think in terms of learning from the d details of the post-merger, um, 
we still need uh, some increase in sensitivity and be lucky with having with the nearby objects. Otherwise, I mean, but now we are putting together several different pieces, um, so we're already making progress in that direction. So already from these events, and even even if we had we were a number of cycles before the merger, already some constraints have been put. And then again, the electromagnetic counterparts uh, can help with that because if you see, you know, you pay attention to when you're forming a black hole versus the supermassive versus. Um, yeah, so it's, it's hard to put a timeline. Also, here we learn a lot more than we expected. Some people, you know, most people believe that during this cycle of LIGO, we would not even see in binary neutral star merger. So <laughs> maybe we always will be luckier than we, we think we are. There was an experiment that was launched and attached to the space station called NICER, mm -hmm. uh, one right. of whose uh, objectives was to study the neutron star equation of state. Um, can I infer from the absence of any mention of that mission that it is yet to deliver on its promise, or are you aware of what it's doing? Yeah, the, uh, NASA, yeah I think it was looking at the uh, lines, uh, if I recall correctly, like a measure, do you remember, like li like a spectral lines, I think, there was... Um, no, the big constraints from NICE are going to come from millisecond pulse. Millisecond right. pulse, okay, so it's and not a different I was going to raise that question. Mm -hmm. That, in fact, the early evidence, which Slavko is old enough... The charm. Here, uh, in my group, uh, yeah. that the equation of state is likely to be hard. So the soft equation of state you were just mentioning is, at the moment, I think, not preferred. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even this event, it's actually it preferred. Uh, there was, uh, from the from the early, from the gravitational wave data, um, for what they could infer, yeah, there is a, a, per, a preference towards a harder equation of state. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, nicer. You know, yeah, you know a lot more. I guess. That, that Let me ask you another quick question. Back on the on the remnant disk uh, mm -hmm. model, what worries me there is, can you really expect jet angles to be that broad? Because the normal black hole jets are typically much much smaller than the 50 degree number. That right, right, yeah, yeah. So that, so yeah. I have a natural, I don't remember it, today. Yeah, yeah. So I guess I made it. Uh, maybe I I didn't. Uh, so I want you. My point is that, that I expect it to be narrower. Yeah. So, uh, because you know, some arguments that have been made, uh, uh, you know, from the community are like, are like, okay, the fact that we only saw, let's say that we saw one out of six, uh, um, has been used as an argument against the fact that, that this can produce a short gamma burst. So my argument there is that jet, jet are in this supposed to be narrower. In fact, also the simulation they should be very narrow. So in fact, you know, the fact that we saw, let's say, one over six is consistent with, it's, it's not surprising. So yeah, so there should not be why they should do. So I, I, I have not yet made the point clear what I meant. They, they, they are an hour, so that, um, yeah, the only, so, you know, this, peop, this argument that people make, you should be having seen more than one, would only be if they were so wide, but we, we're not, we're not expecting that. Here, in. When you talk about two black holes coming together in the Shapiro group, which is not I, Stuart <laughs> Shapiro, Stuart Shapiro. Said <laughs> that they can produce jets, yeah. what are the lifetimes of those jets, and can we observe them in any other existence? Right, it's it's a good yeah, it's a good question. So it's again, so what they call jets, uh, it's a bit like uh, like cars, uh, you know, in our in our simulation. So it is more of a Having magnetic fields from the material, it's, 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 you know, having dipolar uh, production, so it's it's not a real jet in the sense of like having accelerated particles and uh, um, yeah, it's it's a more of like whether you can basically end up with a structure of a field which is more dipolar. So we're still far from actually producing a real jet in the real sense of like in in AGNs and and. Uh, uh, but it's, it's more having, you know, a structure where you'd imagine that then you can accelerate the particles and, and um, that's the part. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's an area that's becoming much more active now given uh, I mean, the observations. But also, I mean, this GRMHD simulation had been re very recent. Uh, like, you know, the, with the binary dino star merger forming neutron star, you know, two, our 2013 was the first one I did, and we were doing more with more configuration. So it is, yeah, so keep, uh, you know, positive <laughs> this thing. So now that we've got the example of 
an off-axis um, merging neutron star triggered by LIGO, what's the prospect of finding purely electromagnetic counterparts of that? Right, so that's uh, it's actually, yeah, um, so they've been, uh, I mean, this is actually, <laughs> they don't know a lot more. So there are a lot of, there are surveys, you know, we're looking for, it would be the, they go under the name of orphan afterglows. Uh, so this would be just um, electromagnetic counterparts. Uh, so that's what you re you refer. Yeah, yeah. So it, they have been searched in surveys, like with timing. But I don't think there's been any uh, any like uh, that I am aware because it, it nothing, <coughs> nothing particular. Yeah, convincing, right? But yeah. So they, they, it's you know it's a class of trends and that people have thought of known as a, a, a yeah of an afterglow. It's, it's hard because this forty mm -hmm. megaparsecs was difficult enough to detect. So right. Yeah. 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 Right. Once you look off axis, you the probability drops really quickly. Mm -hmm. So if I may ask one final yeah. question: <coughs> a plot of uh, time delay between the gravitational wave and the electromagnetic events of the neutron-neutron star type of merger right. as a function of the viewing angle. Uh, so at what point? At what viewing angle are we not going to see these, say, even at 40 megaparsecs? And so what's this upper limit on time delays that we should expect between the electric minute? Um, yeah, so... It, so the, it looked like there was 100 seconds or so. Time. Right, yeah, 100 uh, seconds. Uh, here. Uh, 100 seconds. Uh, yeah, so this is, I guess... From, but I mean, when you are at very large angles, then the also the luminosity is very very low. But so here the time delay is basically mostly dominated by the. Uh, the right. I just wonder if uh, <coughs> Fermi, for example, if you're trying to associate a gamma ray burst with the gravitational wave effect. Right? Oh, I see, I see. I see. I see. I see. You're saying. Yeah, I think the probability to see um, like a gravitational wave and a gamma ray that are not associated even within 100 seconds would be extremely low. This, I mean, a short gamma reverse is like one every few days or something. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I was going to ask, can yeah, you talk about the structure in that plot? It doesn't look like a pure geometric effect. Yeah, because it's actually, yeah, so it's not a purely, uh, so I didn't want to go into too many details. Because it's once with the emission uh, comes here, so there's like a cocoon, it's called. So there's like a lot of fluffy stuff and some which is more uh, like, which is a bit brighter than other that contributes more later time. So we're associated the emission with that where we mostly see. So it's not it's mostly geometry at the beginning, but then you start as you start getting into the dimmer region, there are parts that were, you know, from other regions that were a bit faster, so things are not as linear. Because again it's it's not there is a combination of, of time delay, but it's also the combination of where like the material different angles at which velocity is going and that's not exactly linear with that because it's interaction. Stuff, but that's what I was into there. Yeah. All right, well, thanks a lot.